Hi, cutie. You ready? All right. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. It's actually supposed to be freezing tonight. What in the world has happened here in Phoenix? I know it. I can't believe it. So our hothouse flower from Charleston <laughs> and another one from Texas has managed to come. So tonight, Brad Taylor on my immediate right and Don Bentley over there is going to be talking to him. And um, uh, Stephen Hunter, who is not here, but whose autograph books indeed will be reaching us. So Anyway, that's going to be our program. I'm really delighted that you can join us, and I'm going to hand this over to Don and Brad. Well, thank you for having us tonight. How are you doing, Brad? I'm doing well, Don. So Brad has been kind enough to interview me with many of my book launches, and so this is my time to um, return the favor. So I have about 40 pages of notes, so if you just bear with me, uh, we'll be good. So... Um, what I thought we'd start with is is Devil's Ransom, if you count your novellas, all your books, everything. Devil's, Devil's Ransom is your 153rd book, is that correct? And what, what number is that? Uh, I, uh, I don't know. Count the novellas, it's 25, 23? 25. 25. So 25 books. And there'll be another. So 26 in how many years? Nine. Nine years, folks. 26 books, which is an incredible feat. Um, but what can happen sometimes is that when you're going to write that next book, you start to say, what do I do? That's absolutely right. How do I do it? And so one of the most famous writers, Raymond Chandler, said, when else all else fails, bring in a man with a gun. And so I feel like <laughs> in this book, what you did is say, I'm going to bring in a body instead of a man with a gun. So not to give any any spoilers, but kind of set up what launches um, Devil's Ransom for us. Yeah, so what actually launched it was... Uh, and you do a lot of work in Israel. So there's an, uh, a, a corporation in Israel called NRO. And NRO makes a malware package called Pegasus, which is uh, uh, it's a, a new type thing. It's, it's, they call it zero click. Usually when you get malware on your phone or your computer, it's uh, a fake Google account. And they say, click on this to change your password. Or somebody sends you a text and says, hey, look, what I, look at this picture of me. And you click on it, you get the malware. Well, NRO invented a zero-click malware program that would turn your phone into uh, basically a spy against you. Geolocation they could find, turn the camera on, anything you search for, all your text, everything you talked about, turn the microphone on, make it a listening device. Really bad malware. And they said they were only going to sell them to uh, uh, nation states that were good guys. Well, now the drug cartels are using them in Mexico. And I came upon the story. The uh, UAE bought the, they, they were allowed to buy it from Israel. Uh, our FBI actually looked at it and finally said, well, this is a little bit much even for us. We're not going to do that. Uh, and so they started Project Raven, which was old NSA guys, ex-military people from the National Security Agency, were working for the UAE using Pegasus, and they started targeting dissidents. Uh, then they started targeting journalists, and then they started targeting American citizens. Uh, and all the people that work for Project Raven, believe it or not, are in jail. They pleaded guilty to doing all this bad stuff. But that was enough for me to go, holy moly, that's a pretty cool story. So I started doing research on it, and then I fell, I fell into the uh, ransomware problem set. I a comment on that, but this is a better one. And to me, this one just so captures Pike. And so I'm going to blank out the name of the person that he's talking about so you don't know. But this is Pike on the phone with somebody. And he said, you mean blank and his pack of pipe hitters? They're dead. I killed him in Croatia, and now I'm coming for you. So talk a little bit about who Pike Logan is and why he gets to have cool dialogue like that. <laughs> so he's, uh, well, he's, what, you mean all the way back from yeah, One Rough yeah, Man? Yeah, he is. You've all read the books, haven't you? I don't think I need to go back to the very beginning. <laughs> all right. He that was is, a lazy question. He is. He is. Tell, tell a little bit about him. Just a little bit about so, Pike. Okay. Well, he works for the task force, which is uh, um, when I originally created this, when I originally set out to write, I didn't think I'd ever be published. I was just going to write a story of redemption. And, you know, you Google, how do you be a writer? And they say, write what you know. Well, I was a special forces guy, so that's what Pike became. But if I'd have been a police officer, he'd have been a cop. If I'd have been, you know, a priest, Jennifer would have been a nun. But I was... <laughs> I was a counter-terrorist guy, so that's what Pike became. Uh, and so I had to invent, I worked with a bunch of classified organizations, and I didn't want anybody to say that I was 
just changing the names and writing about real units in a fiction setting. So I completely made up the task force, which we don't have anything like that. People ask it all the time. We just don't. We always fantasized. We wished we had something like that uh, because it's very hard. You, It's impossibly hard to get anything done uh, in the real world. It's really hard to do. So if you have uh, every uh, place on the planet for the United States, there's a lead federal agency that's in charge of it. Well, if you get in a war zone, lead federal agency's me. It's the military. Well, I can do anything I want to in a war zone. I can slay people left and right. But if it's outside of a war zone, lead federal agency's State Department. So if I want to do something in Zimbabwe or in the real world I'm talking about, if I want to take down a terrorist in Zimbabwe, I've got to, one, convince DOD to send me there. Two, I've got to convince State Department to let me operate. Three, I've got to convince the CIA to let me operate. And it's just a whole host of things you have to get through. People always ask me when I used to teach over at the Citadel, it's like, you know, how can we do so many uh, uh, attacks inside Somalia? How come we're killing al-Shabaab we don't do it anywhere else? It's a very easy answer for that. We don't have an embassy in Somalia. There's nobody there to tell us no. I could do whatever I want to. There's no CIA chief, station chief over there. There's no embassy over there. There's no ambassador over there. It is, I can be the lead federal agency there. So you have a cool quote you say sometimes, too, about if this was real and about the PowerPoint and stuff. Can you yeah. Do that? So somebody says, if you want to write a real story, what would it be like? It would be a 300 pages of PowerPoints, and the very last pap- chapter would be uh, mission denied. <laughs> and I... <laughs> So you so um, you talked a little bit about your background, and you um, served in a position of leadership uh, in the um, most premier counterterrorism organization in the world. And so you can obviously see that that in- influences your writing a little bit, and I think your experience has probably influenced your writing a little bit in that this one is set during the fall of Afghanistan and Afghanistan figures very prominently in the book. And so can you talk about why Afghanistan? Yeah, I actually, uh, my publisher actually asked me early on, are you going to write about Afghanistan? And at the time, I was like, no, no way in hell am I writing about Afghanistan. It's raw. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, I'm not going to write about Afghanistan. And But I still was tracking it. I mean, I'm sure you were tracking it. And we were, I'm still reading everything about it. I'm just not going to put it in a book. It's not something I'm going to touch. And then one day I came across a story that they had lost, uh, the Taliban had lost the Bactrian treasure, and they were going to lop somebody's heads off if they don't bring the treasure back. And I was like, what the hell is a Bactrian treasure? Never heard of it. Well, it turns out that in the late 70s, a Soviet archaeologist, way back in the day, was in the steppes of Afghanistan, northern Afghanistan, came across these tombs, and inside the tombs, to this day they don't know who was buried there, but it was somebody rich. And in in the tombs were these uh, artifacts from all over the Silk Road. So they had daggers from Serbia and jewels from China and stuff from Greece and all the way everywhere back and forth full of gold. And it was called a Bactrian treasure. And they took it down to the uh, uh, presidential palace and showed it off to everybody and things like that. Well, then the Soviets invaded, and in 89, the Soviets left. Well, when they left, the treasure disappeared. And everybody figured that the uh, Soviets had just melted the gold or stuck it in their you know, vehicles and took it with them. Well, then fast forward to 2001, we take over Afghanistan, uh, stabilize the government, and this guy comes in Kabul, comes out. He's literally the key master. Hey, i got to show you guys something. I've been keeping a secret here for the last 15 years. Let me show you something. He goes underneath the main bank vault in Kabul. This is a true story. Unlocks it, and there's the treasure. (laughs) He had hidden it all those years and hadn't told a soul where it was. Uh, Well, fast forward to when we were now just leaving Afghanistan, the Taliban's taking over, and they lost the damn treasure again. And so I was like, "That's I can put that in a story right there. So I don't know where the treasure is for real, but in my book I can tell you where it is. (laughs) It's... (laughs) So you also, as as part of Afghanistan, uh, what I thought was super interesting is I've heard people um, probably erroneously describe the Taliban. They're like, what are the Taliban like? And they're like, ah, those are cavemen with automatic rifles, right? You um, show a different aspect of the Taliban and a different aspect of a unit within the Taliban that pr- plays very prominently in the book. Talk about that a little. Yeah, so there's a organ- it's a real organization. It's called the Badr 313 Battalion. And if you look at the fall of Afghanistan just recently, when there was a bunch of guys running through the airfield after we'd left, uh, after Chris Donahue was the last guy on a plane, flew away, um, you can see them running around. They look like uh, uh, Western Soft or inside that building. They've got Pelter helmets on. They've got uh, 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 um, 
multicam uniforms on. They're holding M4s, not AKs. They're not wearing a goat holder thing. And that's about our 313 battalion. And they were literally trained to be, I mean, if um, mimicry is the greatest form of flattery, they said, well, I want to look like, I'm going to look like the Americans. And they had all the equipment, everything like that. And they trained that way. The only difference is they also always had a, uh, a uh, suicide wing as well, which obviously we're not, we don't have a suicide wing, but they did. And they were very well trained. And they did most of the fighting. And they were somebody to be feared. Our conduct forces, uh, the thing he's talking about is that, uh, we're, Pike's going to extract a guy that's trying to flee from the Taliban because he's done a lot of damage to the Taliban. And they really want his head. And so that's how Pike gets involved with it. The bottom 313 guys, a lot of them are uh, trained in, uh, not trained, but went to school in England, went to school in France, speak multiple languages, came back to Afghanistan because they're true believers. Um, but they're just our equal. I mean, not our equal, but they're pretty damn close. They're not like the goat herder with the flintlock. They're, they have all the same equipment we did, and they train that way. So what, what struck me as I was reading that is that you – some of the writer inside baseball is that you need a bad guy that is the equal of your protagonist, right? In order, in order for the reader to feel like there's something at risk. And when I was reading about the Afghan who you picked as the leader of that, I felt like a lot of his, not necessarily mannerisms, but his competence level rivaled Pike's. And I wasn't like, I wasn't prepared for that. I'm like, holy crap. Like this is the Afghan equivalent of Pike, like was that intentional, and how did you go about setting that up? Yeah, it definitely was intentional, definitely. But you, I still, I didn't want to make him Pike with a Taliban beard. You know, it's he's not Pike. Uh, and I had, we actually talked about this. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. You finished the book. Now you realize I didn't take your advice. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring that up, but. <laughs> so I had a problem with the end of the book. So these guys are bad guys. And they get caught, in and in a, Pike's going to solve this problem, but he doesn't have to necessarily kill everybody. He can solve the problem without killing everybody. And uh, I was talking to Don over a beer. Was that at BoucherCon? I can't remember. Yeah, Thriller Fest or BoucherCon. Yeah. And I said, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm going to kill these guys. And he was like, oh, you got to kill them. <laughs> they all got to die, every one of them. <laughs> and I ended up not killing them. <laughs> so, but that brings up a moral dimension for Pike. He's got an issue now. Are these guys going to go back and kill more Americans because I didn't literally murder him right here. Um, but I did want him to be sort of, I mean, he's obviously got a moral compass that's not working and, and he's Taliban, let's face some facts, but he is, his skill sets, he's got a problem keeping his team together because he's got a bunch of rabid guys that just want to kill everybody. And he's like, that's not our mission. Yeah. You run around killing everybody, we're going to get caught over here in Switzerland, Liechtenstein, uh, Croatia. We got a mission to do. Yeah. Get your head in the game and just do the mission. Yeah, and uh, that's why he sells a lot of copies of books is because he doesn't listen to my advice because it, <laughs> it ended up being really well. And I, want, and I want to pull that thread a little bit more because you, without giving it away, the obvious decision for Pike was to kill those guys, and he doesn't. And then you actually have other people ask him, like, why didn't you kill him? Why? And I thought that was really well done. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so he ends up... Uh, he has he has him dead to rights. He's got a sniper in his tree line. They're meeting. They're doing an exchange. They've agreed to a meeting. They've agreed not to bring any weapons. And one of the guys, without giving too much away, one of the Taliban guys is, is just can't take it anymore. He's going to kill everybody. And at that point, he could have triggered. Brett could have popped everybody's heads off, but he doesn't. He just kills the one guy. Uh, and then he lets the other ones go because that's what they agreed to. It was a detente. It was a bridge of spies type thing. I'm going to meet you in the middle of the bridge, and you give me this, and I'll give you that, and we'll part our ways. But then he gets back, and uh, Axe, another guy that's uh, in, in the task force but not on this mission, said, why didn't you kill him? And he says, well, that would basically be murder. They were unarmed, and I would just be putting a bullet in somebody's head, making them kneel and shoot them in the back of the head. I'm not doing that. i got to look in the mirror. When I'm done with these missions, I've got to look in the mirror. And Axe says, well, I may be cleaning up your mess. When these guys go out and kill more Americans, I may be sent to go kill them. And that's a dilemma, yeah. you know? Yeah, I, think th I thought that was so well done because it gives – it gives the reader another aspect um, to Pike's character, and it also delineates, like, you've, you've been very clear that what, certainly you had an incredible background, but what you do in the books is not reflective of what you did in the military or is not reflective of a wartime um, environment. And so you draw that distinction and that engagement, and I thought that was really, really well done. Um, do you, th another part I want to talk about is that when, when Afghanistan was coming apart, there were certainly 
for folks who served over there and you served in both Afghanistan and Iraq, there were emotions that tied both of those theaters together. And you actually mentioned Iraq a couple of times in this book. You mentioned like the hunt for WMD, you mentioned that company. For you as a writer and also Pike as a character, was it essential that you tie those two things together? Did it come out or, or how did that work when you were writing the book? No, I just, that comes out just kind of organically. I don't set out to do that. But we've, as national security, you know, when we do national security, we're not omnipotent. Somebody's going to make mistakes, and there's always the mistakes that are made. Then they, they kind of get held up as, you know, we're never doing that again. Okay, well, you made a single mistake. It doesn't mean that everything's horrible. Afghanistan's a case in point. You know, we've had, um, I can't remember the number now. There's uh, 92,000 troops in South Korea, been there for years, still at war, armistice. And we had a thousand people in Afghanistan, and that's who boy too much. Woo, we got to pull out. And as soon as we do, the whole place falls apart because when we pull out, people don't realize at the time we had a thousand guys there, but our thousand guys were the glue that was holding in NATO. Every NATO member, all told, had about fifteen thousand people there. Well, when America says I'm leaving, they say I'm leaving too. See you later, and the whole place fell apart. I, I was just like this. Anybody could see this was going to happen. Yeah. It was just. Yeah, and and, uh, and there's something else I think that um, probably came some somewhere from your background or, or some of your experiences. You you have a really poignant scene at the end um, in a bar where they're they're kind of toasting some fallen comrades. And so, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I actually, uh, I mean, well, I don't want to talk about my real world stuff, but uh, uh, I set that up because that was something. I mean, we used to do there would be there would be a ceremony, and it would not be a ceremony that that would be on TV with uniforms and things like that. There would be a ceremony that these people would do internal to themselves. And the first time I did it was in The Forgotten Soldier. Uh, they had a guy that got killed. And so uh, actually I had to go back to The Forgotten Soldier and say, well, I'm going to make sure I got this ceremony right, how we do this. Uh, and they went to that. That bar's a real bar. The uh, um, I used to drink when I was I was uh, a liaison at the CIA. I shouldn't say that. I was working at D.C. <laughs> Can we cut that? I, there's a bar there, Four Course Pub, and, and Pike actually, uh, Kurt Hill almost gets killed, and Pike almost gets killed in One Rough Man at that pub. Yeah. And so when I was doing this one, I, I went online, and I was like, holy moly, that pub's still open. And three days after I did it, they're going to blame me, three days after I put him in the book, they had a, was it a car lane? Something drove a car straight through the bar, killed a bunch of people, not, well, put them in the hospital, set it on fire. Uh, he just drove a car right through the plate glass window. Yeah, I, j I just thought that was a really neat look inside. Um, I, I obviously, I've never served in units like that, but I had a friend who did, and he sent he took me to their um, bar in Savannah for the Ranger yeah. Battalion that he was in, and so it's the same. It's it's almost like a shrine to um, Andy Fernandez. Yeah, 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 which is incredible. I, I thought that was really cool that you you put that in there. So now I want to jump to research a little bit. And you have this cool saying that when you go on location to research, there's 90% of the thing that you're going to find and then 10% that finds you while you're there. And, yeah. and so It's actually more like 50-50, believe it or not. 50-50. So talk a little bit about what found you and what you were intending to find. Yeah, so I, I did the deep dive on Croatia, <coughs> and um, I actually got asked today, you know, why'd you pick Croatia? Is that where ransomware originates? There's all kinds of ransomware. I was kind of like, no, it was during COVID, and they let me in. <laughs> I mean, I could make that work, and they were going to let me come on in and do some research, I didn't, and nobody else was, Europe was still locked down. Um, but I knew there was like Cliss Fortress. I, we started out in Zadar. I mean, um, Zagreb, got a rental car, drove down to Zadar, hit every town along the way all the way down to Dubrovnik, Split, uh, Korchula, Var, you name it. We hit all the towns there. And there were things I knew I wanted to see. There's this thing here. There's this thing there. We went to Zagreb right off the bat, and there's a tunnel. It's an air raid tunnel uh, that they used during World War II, and they had just discovered it and reopened it. Now it's a path to cut through the uh, old town. It's just a neat little thing where you can go out through the old town. Well, as soon as I saw that, I, was, I didn't know it existed. And I'm like, that's going in the book. I had to figure that out. <laughs> Took a bunch of pictures. I asked the guy there, you know, where's the speakeasy that the locals go to? I don't want these tourist bars. I need a speakeasy. And he found one, which was in the book. Uh, but some of the biggest part, well, it, I, I didn't. this is not a tourist stop that people would want to use. Uh, 
when Tito was there in Yugoslavia back in the day when Yugoslavia was still there, he had an airfield, a complete military airfield underneath the ground, complete underground city airfield. And I'm like, holy moly, I'm putting that in the book. <laughs> well, it turned out it's ringed by landmines and you can't get to it. So I couldn't use it. But I didn't know it existed. It's not like Croatia is saying, come see our landmine airfield. <laughs> but there was, so my uh, next door neighbors from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Herzegovina and um, she said, hey, you're leaving Havar. You're going to be on the ferry. You're going to drive down to Dubrovnik. You're going to go pass by this town called Molly Stone. And they have the best restaurant in the known universe, and they make the best mussels. Uh, so stop and get some mussels. And so she tells my wife that, Elaine. So, of course, by God, we're going to get some mussels. <laughs> Just if we can take a picture of it, send her. Look, we did what she said. <laughs> well, it turns out Molly Stone is, is Croatian for small stone. And there's a town called Stone, and there's small stone, little stone. And it's ringed by, according to them, I never did the deep dive on this, but according to them, it's the greatest uh, fortification outside of the Great Wall of China. It's the biggest one there is. And, and both of these little villages are ringed by this 12th century wall that would protect the villages. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, I can use that in a book. And I actually knew exactly how I was going to use it at the, the moment I saw it. And it's exactly how I did use it in the book. Uh, but I didn't know that existed. I, if we hadn't stopped for mussels, I, I never would have seen it. In fact, we had the mussels and are eating the mussels. One, the, the people over here are eating, using one leaf of the mussel to scoop the other leaf out. And I'm using a fork. And I'm like, that must be what the locals do. <laughs> That's how you eat a mussel. And then the guy talks. And I'm like, he's from New York. <laughs> so um, for those of you familiar with Brad, you know Elaine is uh, the deputy commander of everything and goes on all the trips and so there's a cool little story you mention in the acknowledgement section, but don't explain about you and your beautiful wife spending eight hours hiking oh. through a forest. So I was wondering if you could tell that for us. Yeah, that was a nightmare. So the Plifitz National, and first of all, if I mispronounce something, then that's, I don't know how to pronounce it. I just, I know how to spell it. It looks like Plifitz National Lake. In fact, when I uh, do the, uh, um, when I was originally doing the audio books, uh, they would always screw stuff up. So the phonetic alphabet is Alpha, Bravo, Charvi, Lima, blah, blah, blah. He would say Lima. <laughs> I read you Lima, Charlie. And I'm like, no, that's not how you say that. And so there's some things that are acronyms and some things that are you spell out. So TOC is a tactical operations center. I'm headed over to TOC. Well, he would say, I'm headed over to TOC <laughs> as he would do it. And so some things like IMSI is an acronym. I-M-E-I is not. Two of them both have to do with phones. One's called MZ, one's called IMEI. So I would send it uh, to him, uh, Rich Orlo and said, look, if you have any questions on any of these acronyms, just tell me. Because JDAM is JDAM, Joint Direct Attack Munition. But we say JDAM. Uh, AAR, we don't say R. We say <laughs> AAR. So just ask me, you know, how, you know, which ones you don't understand, and I'll tell you. Well, he started sending me everything. And I'm like, like when I wrote American Trader, he's like, how do you say these Chinese names? How the hell would I know? <laughs> I know how to spell them, but you're on your own for that. Well, that's what so I say, Plifitz National Park. It's probably not. We were in um, Poland doing research for Ghosts of War, and we're asking these people, how do we get to Lodz? Can we get to Lodz? Can we get to Lodz? And all the Polish people are like, what are you talking about? L-O-D-Z, Lodz. A oh, Wooj. <laughs> the town is called Wooj, like W-O-O-G-E. I was like, it's L-O-D-Z. How did you get Wooj out of that? So when I say Plifitz National Lakes Forest, it's probably something else. But we started, we get there, and I blame my wife for this, because if you, if you bought the tickets while you were on the ground, they gave you a map. If you bought them in advance, because Elaine was petrified that we were going to show up. They only let so many people in. She was petrified we show up, and they'd say, that's our fill for the day. So we had tickets in advance, and we had them on our phone. So we went in there and did it, started walking. The signage is atrociously bad. There's a two-hour trip, a four-hour trip, a six-hour trip, and an eight-hour trip. We're doing the two-hour trip. That's all we're doing. And the cave that's in the book, we found the first 30 minutes. Then we get on a ferry, and we're going across the lake, and uh, there's a bunch of little kids. I mean, they're four-year-olds and things like that. I'm saying we still got to be on the two-hour trip because nobody's taking these kids on an eight-hour trip. <laughs> BS, the Croatians, well, they're hiking. So we go off with all these people. Next thing you know, we're out there. It starts raining. We're out there. There's no way back. And we just kept walking and kept walking. Nobody's speaking English. We don't have a map. I'm trying to talk to somebody. Every sign's pointing a different way. Every time we get to a sign, it says, you know, the boat dock is over here. I was like, we left the boat dock. It can't be up here. What, did we go in a circle? 
eight hours later, we finally are at the very top, and I see a bus, and I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Let me out of here. None of that made the book. We were sopping wet. But it was a high point in your marriage is what I'm hearing. High point right in now. the marriage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I want to jump real quick before we go to reader questions or, or folks, uh, questions people ask me. It's just more of a general kind of technique for you. One of the things that you're known for is your crisp um, action and fight scenes. And I talk a lot about your fight scenes because I, I bookmark like Jack Reacher on one side is very um, blunt force and very simple but works. Yours has a whole lot more technique to it but is also very crisp and it's and it, and it still flows very well and has that same. So when you go to write a fight scene, what does that process look like for you? I actually, uh, what I'll do is uh, set the scene up in my head of well, here's what I want to do. In fact, there's a fight scene early on in Tajikistan, which I completely screwed up. Luckily, I fixed it. So the uh, uh, Jennifer's on a roof with a sniper system. Pike, uh, Veep, and uh, Brett and Knuckles are going in. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any weapons. So it's just going to be a hand-to-hand -hand fight. It's a great scene. I mean, he's in there kicking ass. They're all fighting each other back and forth. And then I got done with it. I was like, why on earth would they go into this building without any weapons? <laughs> Nobody would ever do that. <laughs> Jennifer's out here killing people with sniper weapon. They're just going to run up there barehanded. <laughs> so then I had to come up with, okay, they're going to have weapons, but I still want a fight scene. I just don't want a shootout. Mm. And uh, then you start recrafting everything. Okay, this is because everything, the hardest thing for a fight scene, for me anyway, is there's a thousand things Pike could do. Mm -hmm. He's going to do one. Yep. Well, you better explain why he didn't do 999 to the reader, or they're going to say, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Why didn't he just do X? <laughs> so you've got to, I've got to figure out what would happen here. And sometimes bad things happen in fights. It's not always a perfect, pristine thing. So I can get away with some, but I can't do it to the point where, you know, Pike's going in with his weapon, and he tripped, and it went out the window. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So he was forced to use yeah. his fist. You've got to come up with a reason why he did that. Yeah, I, I like that scene in particular is really good because what he had for his first plan didn't work. And so you, I, I think too many times writers, it becomes very straightforward. And I think what you're really good at is making it hard on Pike, even in the scene, where a lot of times yeah. what he tries to do first doesn't work and he has to flex off that. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit. And uh, when I said that I was coming to interview you, people were kind enough to put some questions <laughs> in the comments. So this one I thought was a pretty good one, and it's, um, have you ever, he was kind of giving homage to the fact that Pike is in some pretty um, hard-to-escape situations, and he said, you know, have you ever, as you're in the drafting phase, put Pike into a scenario and then not been able to figure out how to get him out of it? Yes, I have. That happens, and it's not so much that I can't figure a way to get him out of it, but I can't figure a way to get him out of it without looking stupid. Without the reader going, oh, come on, that would not happen. Because you know, in real life, if you're driving a car and you bend down to touch the radio and then you look up and boom, you're in an accident, you're in a wreck. That happens in real life. Mm -hmm. Now, if I did that with Pike and then the guy he got in a wreck with was the bad guy, I'd be like, well, that's convenient. <laughs> he reaches for the radio and now you found the bad guy? Come on. So you have to really make sure that everything you're doing is, is, is uh, credible. And there's been times when I've completely backed out and uh, said, this is not going to work. i got to reset something. In fact, when they're in split and they're going up the back, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jennifer and Brad are going up the back and he's going in the front, yep. that stairwell is real. That whole place is real. Um, but getting up to stairwell, I was like, how quick could I get up that stairwell? And so, I mean, I did it. I was in split. How quick could I get up there before they trigger, and how soon could you get barrels on? Uh, because when I originally wrote it, they were running around that room a little bit too much. It's not that long of a stairwell. Pike would be on them by now. So yeah. I had to rewrite that so it didn't look ridiculous so real quick you like this book in particular you have so many different locations and so many cool things in each location like you don't there's not one scene i don't think where it's just a bar a generic bar like mm -hmm. every one of them and so is there one thing like one neat thing in particular that you saw on the research trip that was kind of your favorite favorite setting yeah i think it would be um actually the whole the the uh, palace and split is really really cool. Macaroon restaurant was really cool. There, oh, that whole area is really cool. The Game of Thrones I got sick of. Yeah. Game of Thrones is everywhere in Croatia until the point Cliff's Fortress, which I just wanted to go see, is was built in the 11th century. And you sit there and look at this thing on top of a ridge line, going, "How on earth did human beings build this giant fortress 
that long ago without you know any mechanical advantage that we have nowadays. Mm -hmm. And then you get up there and there's a bunch of dragons and they filmed Game of Thrones here. Uh, the underneath split itself is uh, um, cellars from you know Greek times where they still got carvings on the slaves had carved into the walls and it's ancient stuff. Well, that's also where they had the dragons and they filmed that. So it's now it's a Game of Thrones thing. Everywhere I went was some Game of Thrones thing. I was just like, I'm sick of Game of Thrones. So this one is um, maybe more applicable since you do so many novellas and stuff that tie in. Is one of the readers said, do you have you ever thought or do you have any plans? of ever going back before One Rough Man and talking about Pike's um, background before then or what he was doing before One Rough Man or any ideas of ever doing that? So what's that guy's name? Because he hasn't read my novellas. <laughs> <laughs> so the very first novel I wrote was A Call Sign, which is set before One Rough Man. Oof. And uh, The Target, which is uh, Shoshana and Aaron's origin story, is set in 1998, mm. way before One Rough Man. Mm. Two strikes. So I, I have done that a little bit, but not a whole lot. Let's change the question. Do you have plans to do that again? <laughs> I, if it strikes me, I might. Uh, the one I just wrote, which is still being edited, is uh, Pike and Jennifer's Honeymoon. Okay. Yeah. Um, last one from the readers, and I'm going to modify this a little bit. He's, he said, where do you get your ideas? I think a better question, because I've heard you say this before, is when you sit down to, to write a novel, can you walk us through kind of your creative process and how you go about doing that? Yeah. So what there'll be some idea. I, I already explained the whole ransomware and Pegasus thing. That picked my interest. That was it. I was like, that's pretty cool. Uh, from there, then I just start building it out. Who's a bad guy? Who would want to do this? Who would not want it to happen? Who, how is this going to factor? How does Putin feel about this? How is that old girl going to do it? And that kind of stuff. Like, uh, I th probably the best example of where I get an idea from would be uh, the widow strike. So I was reading a bunch of news stories, and um, avian flu, the, actually, I'm going to pat myself on the back for the widow strike. <laughs> Everything in that book, way before we had a pandemic here, it was in my book. I'm like, they're masking social distancing? Wow. I nailed that. I'm a genius. I nailed that all the way down. Um, but avian flu is a very, very deadly flu. It's, uh, it's got a 40% kill ratio. If you look at COVID, it's 1%. So a 40% kill ratio is going to wipe out the human population. So that's the bad thing. The good thing about avian flu is it's not airborne. The only way you get it is you cut your finger and you're messing with a bird that's diseased. You'll get it and you'll probably die. But you can't really spread it like COVID. Well, these people were, uh, um, now we know it's called gain of function. They were making the uh, avian flu airborne. So they could make a vaccine. So if it ever did mutate, it would they would have a vaccine available to keep you know Armageddon from hitting the population. They were going to publish all the results into an open source biomedical magazine, and uh, we we have an actual biomedical board. And this was in when did I write that? 2014, 2013. So it was a long time ago. The head of the board was a guy now known as Dr. Fauci. At that time, nobody ever heard of him. He said, you cannot publish that. If you publish that, you're giving terrorists a blueprint of how to make a biological weapon. Mm. Huge fight went on. Well, I read that story, and I was like, that's a book. Nice. And that's how that whole thing started. But it, nice. after that, I started figuring out who is going to be the bad guy and who's going to be, you know. You call it the vector, right? Like yeah, you my threat vector. Who's going to do vector. what? Because uh, you don't do the same thing every time. I remember saying, sometimes you look like a genius uh, without even meaning to. So I was looking for, uh, I was doing uh, Days of Rage, and I had, um, I didn't want Al-Qaeda, you know, I said, and uh, I was like, you know, these Boko Haram guys have been lopping heads off, I'm going to put them in there. As soon as the book comes out, they kidnap all the girls, and everybody's like, oh, Reds <laughs> predicted the future. I was like, well, they kind of been lopping heads off since 2009, you don't really read about it, but okay, I'll take it. So last one before we open up to the audience, the online folks, uh, anything you want to say about what's coming next? Yeah, I made a mistake. I'm uh, writing about Ukraine. So the uh, should I give away the big thing, Elaine, or no? Keep it secret? No, it comes out in the first chapter. So there's a, a thing in uh, um, in Russia that Putin has. Uh, it's called the perimeter. Have you heard about perimeter? It's a perimeter system, otherwise known as the dead hand. So way back when, in SDI days, when Reagan said, we're going to build strategic defense initiative, which will knock out every Russian missile that comes over here, Russia couldn't compete with that. So they flipped it around and said, well, if you hit us, I've created this thing called the dead hand, which means if you kill the Kremlin, if you kill all our high command, I still have a dead hand on those missiles, and they're going off. Mm -hmm. And it actually exists. It's still there. And so I'm using that. So basically, 
some people in Ukraine were like, well, the only way we're getting him out of Ukraine is to whack him. And he's like, you don't know this, but you kill me, you're all going to die. There's a really old Ralph Peters book that has a similar, I didn't realize. Probably got the dead hand. Yeah. It's probably real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't, guy, I didn't so know. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah that's good. Uh, Barbara or audience, you guys have questions for Brad? Yes. So it's what does your writing process look like? Uh, you mean how often do I write a day? That Should we thing? ask Elaine to answer that question? Yeah, Elaine says he doesn't write. He sits on the couch all day. He does nothing. Um, I don't. I, usually, what people mean when they say what is your writing process, what they really mean is how often do you type? Uh, because I'm always writing. And you know, when I first started writing, it was Google. What, how do you be a writer? You've got to put out 1,500 words a day, or you'll never make it. And I realized that when I put out 1,500 words a day, I ended up hating it. By the end of the week, I just ended up deleting it all. So now though, I'll go days without, I don't write anything. And then when I finally have it in my head, I'll bang it out. And uh, my record, I was on security contract for Operator Down. I did 8,000 words a day for four days. Whacking that thing out. The deadline was quite there. So, And that was Every after day. working a day. Like that's yeah. sitting in your bunk yeah, typing, after right? done working all day, get in the bunk and start banging it out. So that's my record. So I, I don't really um, have any structure whatsoever to writing. I've written in gymnastics meets with my kids, volleyball tournaments, on planes, in bars, you name it. I can write. I, don't, I can block everything else and just start writing. Uh, but until it's in my head, I, I don't want to write. I, just, I, I know I'll just delete it. So that's why I usually say is I'm always writing. I'm in the shower, walking the dog, doing PT. I'm writing. I'm just not typing. Yeah, go ahead. No, I have a. I carry around. I didn't bring it tonight because uh, we went to. We were going to go to dinner, and I didn't want to carry my backpack everywhere like I usually do. I feel like a jackass carrying my backpack around. But I have a journal, a leather journal, that I jot notes in. Sometimes I'll write whole paragraphs. Most of the time, it's just bullet points. Here's A, B, C, and D is going to happen. We were talking earlier about fight scene type stuff. I'll sketch that out. Sometimes it's actual literal sketch. I wrote. Uh, um, yeah, sometimes it's whole pages, though. I mean, an entire chapter, just depending on what I want to write on that. But I don't write longhand all the way through. I'll just get on the computer and start banging out when I'm done. But I have to take notes and make me remember what I'm. What was I thinking of. Nine times, it, I don't know how many times I'd be in the middle of bed at night, wake up and go, that's it. Oh, I can't wait to type that tomorrow. And the next day I'm like, what was that? <laughs> what, did I, what did I have? <laughs> I don't remember what I was thinking. Anybody else? Hey, no, it's all right. I'll borrow this one. So we haven't talked about the thing you thought was the best thing in Croatia. <laughs> It'd be amazing how many people ask me about the gelato because I thought the gelato was great. I put it in the acknowledgments. Every interview I do, that's the first thing you ask. So what's so great about the gelato? Um, it is the best gelato I've had. I've had gelato in Italy. Then supposedly Charleston's great for gelato. They're not. Uh, the gelato in uh, Croatia was the best ever. They had this little... Uh, it's their version of Baskin Robbins. I can't remember the name. It was in Croatian, but they had them in each little town. And we'd pull into the town. I'd see that sign. I was like, pull it over. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting some gelato. It was really good. Right. It was reminding me when I discovered whatever the donut chain is in Canada, it'll come to me in a minute because I forgot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The Horton's donut chain in Canada. Once you get hooked on that, everywhere you go, you know, there you are. So when you split, isn't that Diocletian's palace? I'm yeah, pretty sure. Yep. I remember it because I actually sailed down the coast of Croatia back in the early aughts on a little Croatian boat. It was wonderful. Food was terrible. But um, but the thing was, there, there, it hadn't been discovered then. You could go to Havar and there was no one there, and now they're trying to, you know, ban people from coming. Yeah. But I remember Diocletian's Palace, which is a Roman rune, mm -hmm. right? And then Dubrovnik. Right inside, as soon as you walk in, you go through the the cellars, come up, and there that whole square right there is Diocletian's Palace. Some people call the entire old town Diocletian's Palace, and I never could tell, you know, where's the boundary of this? Which one is which? Because wow. they have a, there's four gates to get out of the old town. Some people call the entire area Diocletian's right. Palace. Others call just that one area that you know that looks like a palace is the palace. Right. So Croatia was actually vineyards for Rome. Uh, Vespasian, who was an emperor that was also a capitalist, as far as I can work out, had an elaborate set of um, vineyards mm -hmm. and Croatian wine. Was um, the 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 Romans drank something called Falernian which I've never tasted, but I think it was very much a sweet wine, like Tokay or something. But anyway, um, 
you know, it's hard for us now when you think in Egypt was the breadbasket of Rome and Israel had water and, you know, they were growing grapes in Croatia and all. And, you know, it hasn't been that long. But climate change and, or, you know, geo yeah. geographical change has, has made those countries different. Well, one thing I didn't, I would have never known if I had gone over there is uh, they, because the north is where Italy was. Right. And the south is where, um, or am I backwards on that? No, you're right. Yeah. So they, the, the uh, guys in uh, um, uh, Dubrovnik didn't want the guys in the north to take them over because it used to be all these city states. And so Bosnia Herzegovina goes all the way to the coast. Right. And there is a spit of land that Bosnia owns that splits Croatia in half. And the whole point of it was if you invade from the north and cross this, you're not only fighting me, you're going to be fighting Bosnia. And that kept them from invading. But it's still there. Now, if you want to leave, you supposedly have a visa for Bosnia, even though you're going to be on the road for 20 minutes and be back in It's Croatia. really complicated. But remember, it was all Yugoslavia for a long yeah. time, you know, after World now War. Now they have a bridge. It's actually supposed to open in 2023. So it should open this year where you can go around. You don't have to go through Bosnia. Right. But, I mean, for a while, all these sort of tribal entities were, you know, it yeah. was all Czechoslovakia, and now it's two different countries. Yeah. And all, and you know, so the map is. They don't like Serbs. Let me tell you that. No, I don't know how Tito ever held it all together, yeah. to be really honest. But anyway, on airfields. <laughs> yeah, I love the underground tunnel thing. I think that's really exciting. There's apparently some terrific hiking in Croatia. I I did it on yeah. the water, so I'm not familiar with the hiking. But did you do any of that? Plifus National Forest. I guarantee you, go there. You can hike for eight hours. Hike to your heart's content. <laughs> uh, I'm smart enough not to do that. So, Patrick, do you have questions from viewers? All right, so Lyndon, who's watching, would like to know uh, how many hours of editing do you do compared to the writing? How, do, how does that split up? Uh, I'm actually, that's a good question. I've never really timed it. Generally, what will happen is we are, I was talking about when I'm collating what I want to talk about or how I want to write. So I'll write four chapters, maybe five chapters, some a section of the book. Uh, and then when I'm thinking about where am I going to go next, I'll go back and edit that. And I usually wait two days. If you read it right off the bat, you don't catch it. If you wait two days and you start catching things, okay, what about this? What about that? What about this? So for me, I, uh, I've i talked to people who say they write the entire first draft and then they go back and edit the first draft. I'm more like a retread. I write, edit, write, edit, write, edit. So I'm two steps forward, one step back as I'm going through the book because I'm thinking about what I'm going to type next and I can edit this. That's easy. I just got to fix it. How do you do it, Don? Whatever Brad says. No. <laughs> no, I've started, I originally did the kind of the entire first draft and then would edit afterwards, but I figured out I'd, I'd get stuck, like what you're saying, and it, I found it'd be easier to do the entire act one and then go back and just do a quick edit because then that puts in your head what's happening and you can go forward. But I still try and finish the first draft about a month before the book's done, and then I spend that entire month polishing and polishing to get it ready. Let's see. Uh, uh, Jordan would like to know, what, what was Brad's favorite novel of your own uh, to research? Uh, any chance of a spinoff novel? So you're talking about what's the, the most fun we had researching? Uh, of your own books, yeah. Yeah, I would say it was No Fortune Son. Is that what you'd say? No, I would say it's, it's the widow strike. We went to Macau, Singapore, Thailand, and Hong Kong. And um, that was a lot of fun because it's obviously a very strange land. You're not used to that. And we had, here's another funny story. So Elaine's a, a fantastic, amazing race person. And so we're at a Buddhist temple, and here come all the cameras, and it's a French version of the amazing race. They're running in. And they're all coming in. They're trying to find something. They're running around with their backpacks. And uh, I actually speak Thai. And so they came running up to me and said, we're looking for this. And I said, well, I don't know where it is, but if you give me a minute, I can tell you, I can find out. So I go to this guy and ask him in Thai, where is this thing? They don't have time to wait. We're going to go. And they run off. And Elaine says, well, let's just beat him to the clue. <laughs> and so... We run to the clue. I've got a picture of me of this little girl who's holding up the Amazing Race sign. They come over. Uh, the, the contestants come over. Now they're all mad at us. And so then they have another thing they have to do. They find this thing out, and he comes up to me and says, where's this place? Where's this place? I don't know. If you wait a minute, I'll, I'll tell you. They don't want to wait. They haul ass. So Elaine says, let's uh, beat him to the clue. <laughs> and so what they had to do, there's a water taxi. It goes across the Chow Prow River. So if you left this place and took the taxi, you'd be right there where the clue is. If you didn't, if you drove in here, you would know that water taxi's there. 
So they got in their car and they had to go to a bridge, which was 20 miles down the river and come all the way back up. So when they got to the other side, we were there with a the clue. <laughs> so, so that was probably the funnest one we did for research. Let's see. Uh, Carl would like to know, would you consider bringing Pike back to Australia? Yeah, I loved Australia. That was a great time, but I'd have to have a, there have to be some reason. I have to delay it a little bit. We did enjoy it in Australia. Uh, let's see. Uh, just a couple more here. Danny uh, would like to know, will Pike ever take on the drug cartels in future books? Not a man who hasn't read the books. <laughs> There's a thing called the Polaris Protocol. Check it out. Oh, Danny. <laughs> missed that one. And he also would like to know, how can I get a letter to you? Through the publisher or through your website? Uh, yeah. Well, if you can contact me on the uh, website, it comes straight to me. It looks all professional, but it really just comes to my Yahoo account. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> Uh, I think that's it. So okay. Far. So, do you remember how indignant you were when you wrote a book that was set, I think, mostly in Taiwan? And one of the reviews that you got said, do you know, that you obviously had never been to Taiwan because, oh, yeah. remember that? I mean, he was so upset when he got here. Uh, it was so annoying. <laughs> Somebody said, well, if you'd ever been to Taiwan, you would see A, B, C, and D. I was like, eh, it's been three weeks there. <laughs> Pretty sure I know what I'm talking about. And I'm right. And I was right. <laughs> they weren't. I was so. in no position to challenge you, never having been to Taiwan. But I did remember, you know, that not every, not all on the on the scene research resonates with every reader. No, because sometimes, well, like for this book, I've got uh, Liechtenstein's in there. I didn't actually travel to Liechtenstein. Uh, I, I just said, okay, I can figure this out because it's just a, it was a base of operations, so I had to find a few things out. I didn't, wasn't a whole lot going on there, and like I did um, the insider threat had a lot of Syria. Well, I'm not going to Syria. I mean, I can fake the funk on that. I, I'm not, not going to go there and start looking at stuff. Uh, but it, luckily for me, at the time, uh, the uh, um, defense attaché at the time inside the embassy inside Syria was my college roommate. So I could send him anything I wanted. How's this to work? How's that work? Um, I had North Korea in a book. I'm not going to North Korea. I'll never wow. go to Russia. But Don has done a fabulous book set in Korea, actually South Korea, one of your. So tell us, Brian, let's give you back the microphone. Catch us up with what's going on with you. Yeah, so um, this year's a little crazy. And what I tried to do was catch up with Brad in one year. And so um, this you year. So you wrote a book a month? Yeah, mm -hmm. a book a month, a book a month. So I have the next Matt Drake book that's called Forgotten War that comes out on uh, the 25th of April. And so that actually takes place during the fall of Afghanistan. And so it happens um, when Afghanistan falls and then actually 10 years prior. And so like a lot of Afghan veterans, like Brad was said, that just resonated with me. And I knew I had to put that in the book. And then I have two Tom Clancy, Jack Ryan Jr. books come out. So Flashpoint comes out in May. And the other one doesn't have a title because I'm still writing it. But it is also supposed to come out this year. So that's going on with me. Wonderful. I really love Don's books, both the his own series and the Clancy books, which keep changing. Any of you watch the new Jack Ryan on television? You know, I thought it was the best of the three. There was some astonishing action. And what I really love is thanks to drones, there are amazing scenery. I mean, they're in Prague. Remember? I mean, it, did you happen to watch it or would it just yeah. screw up whatever you're doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, but really, didn't I mean? I really thought that the scenery for it was amazing. Is I'm trying to remember. Is that the one with all the stuff in Moscow, or is that something else I recently watched? Because I did watch. I watched Mark's um, The Gray Man because Mark is coming in next month. So and I'm only four episodes into it, and this one was actually so. It, it isn't it this the one with the the, the Russian? Yeah, guy? it it has the Russians in Ukraine, but it was actually filmed before the Russians invaded Ukraine. Well, it and had so, to be because yeah. if you've never been to Moscow, and I have meant to go, but now instead I'm going to cruise the Great Lakes because I don't think it's a really good idea to go to Moscow. Um, but I spent a lot of time in St. Petersburg. But there is some fabulous footage of Moscow, and it may be the closest that we come to it. But I thought the plot held together better than the other ones. And then Prague featured back into Mark Graney's The Gray Man, which um, I just happened to watch, um, which I thought got a little... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Um, generally six months, about six months. 
Yeah, but so, it could really change. I mean, yeah, sometimes can, for some yeah. people, it's like two years, and for other people... So I was doing two books a year, then it was definitely... I mean, that flash to bang on that thing was you you had to get the jacket copy and the cover art in on day one because it six months out, they're sending catalogs out to the bookstores. Uh, and then when the edits are done, it's got to be... I mean, it's well, quick. Yeah. I actually... I would finish, I would hit the end... And they'd say, okay, great. I need the plot title and, and jacket copy for your next book. I mean, I literally just hit the end. I am not there yet. So they're editing the first book, and they want me to start the next book. Uh, Why did you set yourself? Because you were here for all of those books. We saw yeah. you in January, yeah. and then we yeah. saw so him in yeah. June or July. He preferred January because June and July was sort of grim. But, um, you know, what what impelled you to, to do a book every six months? I had a... Uh, so. I didn't know anything about the publishing world. I still don't know anything about the publishing world. So I would write a book, and then uh, the publisher would sit on it. I'd get it in early, because I, I was still doing a lot of security contracting because I, you know, I had to feed my family, uh, and writing wasn't paying the bills. And so if I, I would look at my schedule and say, my book's due in December. I'm going to be on a contract from July to January. i got to get the book in in July. So I would turn it in in July, and they would do cheetah flips. Because it's, wow, he's six months early. Well, then I get mad. I'm like, why aren't you putting my book out? Uh, because something could go wrong in the real world. You know, I'm writing current events, and the problem with current events is they're current. Uh, so if we something went wrong in the real world, my book would be worthless. And so I'd say, put it out, put it out, put it out. And they would say, I'm not sure you realize this, Brad, but you're not our only author. <laughs> we have other people. We have a schedule of releases that we do. Glad you turned in early, but December's when it's coming out. That's when it's coming out. And so I did that for three books until they said, okay, smarty pants, you want to do one every six months? We'll do one every six months. Uh, and I said, yeah, I can do that. And there's a whole different ball of wax from turning a book in early when you have all this time and having the, the six months, you've got to turn it in. That's it. And uh, so I did that for four years and it about broke me in half, as it will be doing to Don here shortly. <laughs> Well, I know you said, but, but are you finding that with more time, you're actually spending it writing? Or do you find, see, that's that's the thing. Over the years, I can't tell you how many authors have said they're living to the day when they can give up their job and they'll write full time. And then guess what? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, Elaine's actually says, actually, when COVID came in, it was kind of like, what are you going to do today? I'm going to lay on the couch. <laughs> uh, so I got to get back into it to get the mojo back because I, I was doing... Two novellas a year, two books a year, uh, three security contracts a year, two book research trips a year, two book tours a year. I mean, I don't know how I did it. I honestly don't know how I did it. I mean, I look back on that, I'm like, I don't know what we were thinking. Um, yeah. That's true. Younger younger actually helps. And I'm glad you're on a yeah. slower schedule. And at some point, Don, it's amazing. you'll have it's to. Actually, <laughs> it, it, you start burning the candle at both ends. And uh, I was writing Ring of Fire. And I remember telling Lane not going to make the deadline. This will be the first one I am not going to make a uh, the six month thing. I just can't do it. I just burned it up so much that it just was not working. And my uh, editor called me and said, hey, we think we're going back to one book a year. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> say it isn't so. And so I got an extra four months to finish that book and it worked out. And then I went back to one book a year. That's excellent. Something you said before that I thought was really funny when we were talking is that when you have gotten to the point where you are now and you've written so many books, that any time you start to do a fight scene you do and it feels normal or familiar, it's because you've done it before. Yeah. yeah, that's the hardest thing. You don't want to do the same thing in every book. You want to do something different. And uh, in the real world, it, technically, your cell phone, what you have, your smartphone, that's how you're going to get caught. You look the guy who murdered everybody in Utah. How'd they catch him? It's a cell phone. They found a cell phone. But you don't want to do that every book. Because people, we go, cell phone again? Well, that's kind of how they do it. I mean, I almost won't say, you know, oh, he's going to shoot a pistol again? <laughs> yeah, he's going to shoot a pistol. It's a gunfight. Um, so I'm always looking for ways to do stuff that is not involved the same old, same old. And I look at criminals. That's who does that stuff. You find a criminal, and that's how you do it. And I saw this. I had to find a cell phone. This was no fortunate son. I had to find a cell phone in um, Paris, in one of the uh, uh, ghettos of Paris, uh, where they had these guys kidnapped and things like that. And I was like, how am I going to find a cell phone without doing the usual, you know, MZ grabber stuff? Well, in New York City, they had a, uh, um, everybody has their cell phones that are turned on all the time. 
and you go for Wi-Fi, nobody, very few people say, ask me every time I want to hook up to Wi-Fi. So like if I go into my house, my phone automatically hooks up to my Wi-Fi because it knows it. Well, if you go into Starbucks and you hook up to the Starbucks Wi-Fi, the next time you go into Starbucks, it hooks up to the Wi-Fi. Well, in New York City and Manhattan, they, these criminals figured this out, and they hovered a drone at the first intersection from the Starbucks right above the street, and everybody walked out of that Starbucks and sat there and waited for the light to change, tricked the phones into saying, you're back in Starbucks, hook up to this. And then they sucked all the data out of that phone and stole their identity and you know their credit cards and everything else. And I read that, and I'm like, that's how I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'll just fly this drone over until it, you know, make it connect. You got to set all that up. But I was like, that's how I'm going to do that. I'm not going to, that's all fine. That's the criminals are the ones that I look at now. So basically, you have to wander the world and wait for stuff to strike you, right? right? Yeah, these <laughs> criminals are pretty good about that stuff. Sometimes. I would never have thought of that. That's really frightening. Wow. We also depended on it, you know, and I think the first yeah. rule for any criminal would be leave your cell phone at home. Yeah. Yeah, you would think that. And then they always have that, we, you know, you watch forensic files and it's, uh, his phone was working all day long and then the day of the murder, it dropped off the net. It's like, well, that's kind of an indicator in and of itself. <laughs> Very true. Well, thank you, guys. It was really a fabulous interview. Thank you. Love it. Give our authors a round of applause, if you will. So I left a book there on the table, which one of you can hand me. It is called Murder Book by Tom Perry. Bless his heart. Anybody who reads Michael Connolly knows all about murder books, right? Yeah. You can't, but Tom painstakingly explained to us what a murder book was. <laughs> I loved it. Anyway, I usually give away an advanced reading copy at one of our events, but I don't know. Did we did we do numbers tonight, John? How many? Eleven? Eleven. Thank Eleven you. Okay. That's the one you're picking? No, that's what I think he said. No, that, that's oh, okay. how many numbers we oh. gave out. I wanted to ask you if you would pick a number between 1 and 11, and we'll give this book to that person. Eight. Has to be, you have to <laughs> look at your number. Huh? And you actually have to be here, so if number 8 didn't come. Are you number 8? Not number 8? Nobody's number 8? Six. Four. No, 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 <laughs> wait, wait. If he's six, you six. are you six? Okay, we're gonna hand you. You've been so nice playing with the puppy anyway. We should definitely give you one. She's our best audience, don't you think? <laughs> She's so great. Anyway, um, we are getting us. I'll remind everybody and any of you watching, if you order a copy of Brad's book um, before we run out, we will have a bracelet that we can send you with it. Brad is not responsible for the bracelet. <laughs> only. Only the publisher in the bookstore, right? But you have to wait for it. And any of you who wanted a Stephen Hunter book called Bullet Garden, we are sending our copies to Stephen, and they will be back. It's probably going to take about a week to get them here. So um, uh, did you buy one here? Yeah, you could leave it. Well, we're going to trade it in is what we're going to do. So you might as well keep it and then trade it in when the books come. They're not. We're not shipping our books. It's a new batch of books going to Stephen, and then we'll just swap them all. Hmm? I don't think so. I think we'll be fine. I can't control everything. I really try, but it doesn't always work out. Anyway, thank you very much for braving this ridiculous temperature here. I couldn't believe how cold it was when we went out. So 